Good morning everybody listening to us from Europe and good afternoon to all of you listening here in China. Welcome to the EU SME Center webinar series. Thank you for joining us today. Um, just before we get started, for those of you that are new to the system, you will find on your desktops um, a little um, platform where you can uh, uh, raise any questions during the webinar. Um, just so that I can see how many of you can hear us so far, I would ask you to raise your hand by pressing the hand icon. So I can see that we've got uh, many people joining us today, so thank you for raising your hands. If you're experiencing any technical issues, please let us know in the chat box. And as I mentioned just now, continue to submit any questions or difficulties that you might encounter during the webinar and we will try our best to answer you. For those of you new today, I know that there's some, um, there's some um, revisits of, uh, of uh, attendees, but for those of you that are new to us today, just a reminder of the USME Center. Uh, we're a business center established in Beijing and funded by the European Union and we're assisting European SMEs to develop and maintain their commercial activities in China through export and investment. And we offer a series of uh, information, advice and practical support services. So a look at our services. Um, we provide information and advice in the areas of business development, legal, standards and conformity, HR and training. And this is in the form of documentation, answering inquiries, providing trainings and webinars. We also have a whole series of support services, hot desks um, within the center. We receive trade delegations here, matchmaking and networking services, as well as online databases. And these are all available from our website, including the Ask the Expert button where you can post us inquiries online and we will do our best to answer you within seven working days. In order to help SMEs get ready, engage their preparedness for coming into the Chinese market, we've just launched a new tool. Um, I invite you all and encourage you to go through the online quiz to gauge how ready you are and how ready your business is to conduct business in China. And following that, we have a series of four reports that provide essential step-by-step um, -step information to help you get ready and to tackle the Chinese market. So, to the topic of today's webinar, how to establish wholly foreign-owned enterprise and a representative office in China. This is a question that typically is on the minds of many small and medium enterprises looking to the Chinese market especially those that are focusing on mid long term strategy and looking to invest in China. But obviously before any investment decision is made, it's essential to understand the full implications of each option in order to make not only an informed decision, but the decision that would best suit your company's development and business scope here. So today we have our resident legal expert, Ms. Lamilla Hiklova, and she will introduce to you the essentials on setting up a rep office or a woofie. So these are two terms that are commonly heard uh, when talking about investment in China and representing two of the most popular modes of entry. Ludmilla is going to take you through the processes, the questions that you should be asking yourselves before engaging, and the pros and cons of each model. So without further ado, I pass you over to Ludmilla. Good morning. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Hello, everybody. Thank you all for the introduction and uh, let's start with the, today's webinar. So uh, what we will do uh, today in today's webinar, we will focus or at the beginning we will mention shortly what options are generally available for foreigners when they decide to invest in China. We will uh, uh, answer or try to help you to answer a question when it's a good time to open a permanent office in China. We will describe what processes are involved in the establishing of wholly foreign out enterprise and the representative office. And we will touch practical differences uh, between running uh, WUFI and the representative office, for example, administrative obligation taxation. Before we will go directly to now, to the topics, 
we have a first poll for you and the question is uh, what is your experience with investing to, to China? It's our usual um, question uh, to assess uh, the, the knowledge and the composition of uh, our audience in order we can better target our, our uh, presentation. So if you can please uh, choose one of the three answers. One is uh, if you are under preparation and the second one is if you have already established rep office here and last one if you have a company in China. So we will give you a few, few more seconds and now, uh, we will share with you the results of the poll and the results are as, as follows. The vast majority, 70% of you are in the process of the preparation. 23 uh, of you, 23% of you, they have already, you have already some company here and uh, the smallest uh, share uh, of our audience have representative office. So I think it's a right time uh, to, uh, to have this webinar and I hope that the information we are bringing you today will help you uh, to launch the process in, in a correct way. So firstly, as I mentioned, we will shortly mention what options for uh, foreigners are uh, available when they decide to have a permanent presence in China. It's a representative office, it's the first one. It's not kind of an investment, but it's an it's a office here. So uh, it's the first option. Second one is uh, foreign invested enterprise, which basically covers uh, three entities. One is wholly foreign out enterprise uh, and the second group is a joint venture which consists of either equity joint venture or cooperative joint venture. And in uh, recent three, four years there is another vehicle available for the foreigners when they decide to invest to China and it's a foreign invested partnership which has basically two forms, general partnership and the limited liability. So, uh, before we start uh, in description uh, about the processes and the differences, very short definition. It's a very simple uh, definition but uh, we, will, we made it this way in order to avoid uh, misunderstandings because a lot of people think that the representative office is kind of agency, yeah, which, is, which is like an independent legal entity and so on. It's not the case. Representative office is, you can uh, consider it as one of departments of your company, but it does not uh, sit in your headquarter, it sits, it's located in China. And it's not an independent legal entity. Yeah. It cannot conclude contract uh, on its behalf. All contracts which uh, is concluded by web office are concluded on behalf of the headquarter uh, in your home country. WUFI, which is abbreviation for wholly owned foreign enterprise, uh, however is a, an independent company. Uh, it has form of limited liability company and its registered seat is China. So that's the basic two differences between two. So let's start with representative uh, office. Uh, when it comes to the time, not to decision uh, when to open representative office, uh, very probably most of you uh, have conducted already some preliminary market research and uh, the results of that uh, market research uh, is positive. So you know that China is a uh, market for your product, for your services and you want to have something uh, in, the, in the place here in China. Uh, and you want to continue uh, in research and surveys. Uh, you want to connect regularly with local and foreign contacts here and uh, or coordinate the foreign enterprise, your uh, headquarter activities here in China. So this is basically the purpose for which or the purposes for which the representative office is, uh, is established. However, 
representative office, and it is very important uh, to, to note, is not allowed to directly engage in any business for profit, which means it is not allowed to collect uh, money or issue invoices within China for services or products. As well, what is not allowed to represent any other company that the company that, that the headquarter uh, here in China. So, for example, if you have two companies or three companies back in the in the Europe, and uh, one of those companies will establish a representative is representative office in Beijing, this representative office can provide support only to the mother company back in the Europe. No to the other other two. And uh, last but not least, uh, rep office is forbidden to buy any property or import production equipment to China. Thank you, Ludmilla. Uh, what, what would happen actually if your rep office was found to be engaging in any of the above here in China? I mean, what would be the consequences of that mm -hmm. for a company? Yeah. The consequences uh, would be very probably the same as, uh, as would happen in um, anywhere in the Europe, which means uh, imposing a fine, imposing a penalty. And in the worst cases, in the worst scenario, it will be uh, revoking the, the uh, registration of the representative office. Uh, the amount of the penalties I will touch uh, in a few slides, few slides later. So now we go uh, to the uh, requirements uh, when you decide to practically establish the rep office. In 2010-2011, uh, there was issued a new regulation, a basically two regulation, uh, regulations, which, uh, which, um, which brought more strict requirements of establishing and running representative office. One of those requirements is that the headquarter of the company uh, has been set up for at least two years in its home country. So if you have a company which was set up this year or the last year, uh, you, will, you will have difficulties or probably will not be possible to establish representative office here in China. Uh, another requirement uh, relates to the, uh, to the paperwork. Uh, most of the important documents which you have to submit during the registration process like incorporation certificate and the bank reference letter of the headquarter needs to be notarized in your home country and subsequently legalized by the Chinese uh, embassy or, or the consulate there. And uh, I mean just to make clear those are not all requirements uh, which are uh, which are uh, asked for the headquarter uh, to, to fulfill. We are just pointing out a few the most important ones and those where the changes uh, occurred. Articles of association of the headquarter have to be submitted to the administration of industry and commerce. This administration is a bureau which uh, register all, uh, all companies and all uh, representative offices. Uh, now we come to the procedure, to the process of establishment. So first, when you put together your pa paperwork, you'll have uh, the documents which I mentioned on the previous slide, like application, um, uh, certificate of the incorporation, uh, documents for the chief representative put together, notarized, uh, verified by the consulate, then you will approach the administration of industry and commerce and uh, apply for the registration. Once uh, application and registration is finished and you, uh, you obtain the registration certificate, you will proceed to the Public Security Bureau and uh, apply for making official jobs. Uh, official jobs uh, we have mentioned uh, with our previous, uh, previous uh, webinars, legal webinars, but it's, uh, it's very important in China, company job and legal representative job and um, representative office job because it equals to the signature of the person 
authorized to act uh, and um, act on behalf of the company. So it's not like any other any other job uh, in uh, in Europe. Then after you have the company, uh, after you have the uh, representative office stamp, you will apply for the organizational code. Uh, and finally, you have to register with local and uh, tax authorities. This is the certificate procedure finished. However, there are other registration to make, which one, one of them is registration with the customs office, opening RMB account, uh, because very probably you will need to, uh, or certainly you will need to receive foreign currency on your accounts you will have to apply at the state administration of foreign exchange uh, for certificate related approving that you can uh, open a foreign currency account and only after that you will uh, you will be allowed at the bank open, open that type of the account. Uh, now he will, you will see a sample of the certificate of the registration and uh, those are the information uh, which are usually uh, on that certificate, which is name of the rep office. There are some guidelines how the name should look like. It's always the name of the country, then it's the uh, name of the place uh, where the rep office is located. So for example, it's uh, uh, Poland, uh, Poland regi registered if it is a uh, representative office of the Polish company, then uh, it is to be uh, clear in the name of the company. It's uh, Polish and it is a representative office located in Beijing. If being included in Beijing, it of course shall have uh, include uh, the mentioning that it's a rep office. Thank you, Ludmilla. I think that um, covers the um, initial uh, application process and the documents that are required. Um, obviously, the next step would actually be the, the physical setup, I should imagine, for the rep office in China. And therefore, we go into the areas of, uh, of hiring of staff for the, uh, for the rep office. So I'd like to launch another poll at this stage. Um, and it is in this question, can, can a, a rep office employ on behalf of the headquarters um, staff? And if so, yes, is it both foreign and local? Are they able to employ both foreign and local staff? Only local employees or only foreign employees? So I leave you uh, a couple of moments to, um, to answer our poll. And then uh, we'll look at the, uh, the answers together with, uh, with Lynn Miller. So uh, just give you a couple more moments um, and I'm going to close the poll now So and pass over to you, Ludmilla, to see the answers. Okay, so here we can uh, see the answers. I pass over to you, Ludmilla. 81% saying yes, um, can hire both foreign and local employees. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you, Amor. Uh, actually, it's, it's not correct. Uh, the the answer is uh, the third one only only foreign employees. However, I must admit that this question is a little bit tricky because most in most cases the uh, um, uh, in most cases the foreign employees are employed by uh, by headquarter. So the uh, representative office uh, is basically when it concludes the contract uh, and concludes the contract on behalf of the headquarter. However, the local employees, they cannot have a direct employment contract with the, uh, neither with the headquarter, neither with the rep office. They have to be employed by uh, special agencies uh, like CIIC or the FESCO and we will cover it on the next slide. So uh, those are two points we made uh, in relation to the employment of the staff. Representative office can employ not more than four representatives, including the chief uh, representative. 
usually it is uh, it is the case that the chief representative is a uh, foreign uh, foreign person uh, but it does not need to be the case it can be a uh, local Chinese person as well and in, the, in addition to the chief representative that can be another three representatives uh, which can in some cases substitute the chief representative and representative represents the headquarter however as I mentioned the local staff has to be employed through the local agencies and you can see two of the most uh, most large ones, the largest ones here I see at the FESCO. Uh, with regards to the chief representative, Ludmilla, um, what kind of profile um, would that chief rep be? I mean, how accountable is that person for the rep office in China, according mm -hmm. to Chinese law? Mm -hmm. I mean, chief representative is something like a um, legal representative for the, for the company means that uh, he or she is responsible that uh, the representative office fulfills all duties, obligation uh, from the, I mean, coming from the Chinese laws. However, uh, he is not personally liable, if he, of course, if he does not commit any, any crime, but he is not uh, liable uh, personally. Uh, it's a headquarter. Uh, and then the headquarter is liable and then if it's uh, done something wrong then the headquarter uh, goes after the chief representative. Okay, so let's we'll continue with the with administration. Uh, the mentioned um, change in the laws uh, in 2010 and uh, 2011 brought a uh, few other requirements uh, relating to the administration. One of them is that in case there are any changes uh, related to the headquarter, uh, for example, change in authorized signatories or form of incorporation, increase or decrease of uh, registered capital, uh, business scope uh, or representative, representatives, everything shall be uh, notified to the local means Chinese administration uh, of industry and uh, commerce. And uh, here uh, we comes to the to your uh, former question about the penalties. Mm -hmm. the, here we can see the range uh, um, of the fines which is between 10,000 RMB to half million and um, of course the most painful is uh, revocation of registration certificate. Uh, now we quickly go through the uh, another um, uh, obligation of the representative office which is accounting uh, tax and annual check and review uh, not many at least in the past past years not many representative offices paid uh, attention to bookkeeping however uh, rep office is uh, obliged based uh, on the on the law to maintain accurate accounting bo books and it is highly probable that the tax authorities local tax authorities will check uh, the, the the books especially during the first years of uh, of establishment as regards the tax i will go only very quickly through it because we have a special guideline where we have a special guideline on establishment of the uh, representative office and uh, you can see you could see then they very nicely explain how the tax is calculated so briefly one of the options is cost plus uh, method which is applicable to the rep office which uh, is not able to accurately assert an expenses uh, but not turnover and the second method is deemed profit method, which is for the rep office, which are able to accurately assert a turnover, but not expenses. Uh, what is new under the current uh, legislation is a new check, a new review for the representative office. Since uh, 2011, even the representative office, not only the Chinese companies, not only the WUFI foreign invested companies in China, uh, have to undergo the annual check 
which means submission of the report of the rep office on uh, operational status uh, of activities which are carried out by this rep office during the during the past year and includes as well audited income and expenses statement. So this was the first part about the representative office uh, which we deem not very uh, complicated and then now we go to foreign art enterprise. Um, thank you, Lumilla. Just before you go into the explanations of uh, WUFI, I noticed that we're getting quite a few questions coming through, some pertaining to rep offices. What I will actually do, though, to save time is I'll keep these to the end. We have a, a dedicated question and answer session at the end. So if we haven't got to your question just yet, if you bear with us a moment, and uh, we hope to um, answer them uh, as best we can towards the end of the webinar. <clears throat> okay. So let's go to the to the WUFI. Uh, when it's the time to open a WUFI in in China, it's uh, the decision comes when you want to do business in China, but from China means that it's not only it's not enough for you to export, for example, uh, products or services from the Europe to China or to have only the representative office, but you need a physical permanent presence and. Uh, for different uh, different um, uh, different uh, opportunities, like for trading, importing, exporting, for manufacturing, or you would like to provide services or consulting. Uh, the WUFI is is a good option when you wish to uh, better protect your IPR. It's comparing to the joint ventures. Of course, in any case, we strongly advise to. Uh, to register your and to protect your IPR before you start to do any business any business in China. Uh, Wufi is a good option, a suitable option when you uh, would like to have a more control or sole control over your business and uh, joint venture partnering with the local Chinese uh, Chinese partner uh, cannot bring you any 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 added value. So in those cases, the WUFI, and of course there are more other uh, reasons why to establish the WUFI, we have mentioned only the uh, important ones. Uh, however, what is important to, to know that to establish 100% uh, percent owned foreign uh, invested enterprise, it's not allowed for all industries and activities. What it means? Uh, there exists foreign investment catalog, which is a list of uh, encouraged, restricted, and forbidden activities. And the, the difference between them is first how much support you can get from the from the Chinese government when you engage in those types of activities and the sectors or on the opposite side, how much troubles you will encounter you know, when you engage, for example, in um, uh, activities which falls into the restricted area. So, uh, and in relationship to the WUFI, it has that, for, for example, some restricted uh, industries or the activities, uh, you can have only a joint venture, uh, joint venture limited liability company. <coughs> so. um, what is as well important to consider be before you come or you start to uh, establishment process is to think about location. Uh, you have to choose the location which is suitable for your business in terms of the suppliers if you need any customers, uh, competitors, how, uh, how the location is connected and accessible, so means you have to be aware about the logistic. What is important as well is to consider administrative support and the incentives. Currently in China there are a lot of, um, a lot of zones and, and uh, industrial parks which, offers, which offer uh, various types of the, of, the, of the support. So shop around, uh, don't hurry, and uh, get uh, information uh, together. Um, 
I just would like to remind in this section that uh, you can use uh, our services, services of the USME Center. Uh, we can help you in, uh, in those questions. Uh, of course, that's very essential to prepare a business and financial plan. I am mentioning uh, it here uh, in this place, uh, especially in connection with the registered capital and the total investment. Uh, I will touch it a little bit later uh, later on, but these uh, documents, uh, like the business and financial plan, will be ones which are important when you will apply, when you submit application to the administration of industry and commerce. And, of course, as mentioned before, uh, register your IPR. Yes, um, intellectual property is obviously a, a key issue here in China. Um, and here, actually, I would um, also inform you that there's another uh, EU-funded project, uh, the China IPR SME Help Desk, which is available to provide very practical support on all IP issues relating to doing business in China. And I think that shortly we will send you a link to their website. Um, so um, keep, keep your eyes open for that link there. Um, and we continue in the establishment of the Bufi. There is very practical and useful to ask few initial questions because it will help you with your with your inquiry. Oh, it will help you with your uh, preparation for uh, for establishment with your paperwork. So the first question is: What business activities will the Bufi perform? What is important is because one of the one of the papers will be uh, you will receive will be the business license and of that business license will be written what your company is allowed is authorized to to do so think about which business activities you need then uh, what will be your operating costs before you can support your business and your staff here in china from the profit because you can uh, finance your company uh, till the moment you have a profit only from the total, from the registered capital or the total investment. Then uh, in terms of the people, you have to choose a right person uh, who will be responsible to act on behalf of the company. This person uh, is called in China its legal representative. Mm, of course, uh, you need to have, you will need to have as well someone uh, who is uh, responsible for the day-to-day -day management of the company, and this person will be then registered as a general manager. And um, interesting thing, uh, think about the name, think about the Chinese name, think about the English name uh, as well. Uh, as regards the name, uh, I would like to mention uh, two things. First one, that according to the Chinese law, only Chinese name will be considered as official com company name. You can, of, you can uh, register English name as well, but both has to be consistent. Uh, and, uh, but for the future communication with the offices, with the authorities, the Chinese name is the, is the official one, is the decisive one. And um, and the uh, meaning uh, of the company is important as well. Maybe in, in this. Yes, I think um, from a branding perspective as well, it's very important to, to think ahead um, of the Chinese name that you will give your company. Um, obviously, it's important to, to understand the meaning of the Chinese characters as well. Um, there's some very good examples already of companies in the market. I mean, a couple of companies that spring to mind are um, Carrefour, the French hypermarket chain. They're known in China as Jialefu, which is quite a clever um, meaning of a happy and prosperous home. Um, or I can also think uh, of IKEA, Idia in Chinese, which means comfortable home. So the the, the actual the Chinese name is very important and will actually set the set the scene as well for how you market your your services or your products in China. Okay, and we continue with the, with the business scope. Uh, I touched a little bit on the previous slide, but the business scope is really, really Im important. 
It's a list of all activities which are allowed to allowed to perform by your company. Uh, there is, uh, it's a little bit tricky to draft the, the business scope in a way uh, it covers all the activities you need to perform, but at the same time to give you enough space for the inter interpretation. So in engage someone, engage some law company, uh, legal advisor who has already experience with drafting the business business scope uh, in order it will not make you troubles uh, in the in the future. Why the business scope is important as well because uh, not only the uh, I mean the I will touch a little bit later but you can have uh, when you will register your company you need several approvals uh, the easiest one, if you decide to establish a consulting company, then uh, you don't need any special approval from uh, from the authority other than uh, uh, other than Mofcom. But in case uh, you will you will be engaged in an industry or in the activities like just for example uh, education or or financing uh, financial business touch the financial business that you would need to have more approvals and all this have to be covered by the by the business scope <clears throat> now uh, now we go uh, for the uh, application process application for the business license I have to say that uh, the application uh, and the registration uh, is, is quite a long uh, process and it is basically divided into two parts. First, one, uh, first part is ended by issuing of the business license and it starts with the name availability check and the name registration at uh, state administration of industry or commerce or better at the local branch of uh, administration of industry and commerce. Then after you uh, receive approval to establish foreign invested company by local Bureau of Commerce, uh, you, you will proceed to the administration of industry and, uh, industry and commerce and uh, receive the, the business license. This uh, first part is the, is the crucial one because without a uh, business license you cannot proceed, uh, you cannot proceed further. This is example how the business license look looks like. Uh, this one is called a uh, small business license, uh, which is usually stored uh, in your in your say somewhere in the company. So after the business license is issued, uh, you will uh, uh, you will continue with the public security bureau. This step is the same as with the rep, rep office and you will apply for uh, making official jobs of the, of the company. After that you will go for the organization code, uh, you will register with local and state tax authorities, open RMB and a foreign exchange account. For the opening of the foreign uh, exchange account you would need uh, before register with the state administration of foreign exchange which will allow you open a foreign currency capital account. There are differences between a foreign currency capital account and uh, foreign currency current account. However, it's a little bit complicated and if you are interested uh, in the differences more you can uh, check the, uh, the guideline which we have on the, on the establishment of foreign invested enterprises. Uh, after you you open that capital account, you can inject the capital. Uh, and once the capital is injected, you will apply certified. You will apply uh, for the uh, for the ver capital verification report, follows by updating business license, financial registration, and a statistic registration. These two processes are quite straightforward. Uh, usually, from my experience from my experience is uh, that the most crucial one is the uh, get the business license, first get the approval to establish the foreign uh, foreign company, second is uh, to get the approval 
or to get the registration uh, for the business license and then the part of the injection of the capital. Then follows uh, registration with the customs and commodity inspection if it is applicable in your case. Thank you, Lib Miller. I think that's um, it's quite a neat way of summarising what is, um, quite, as you mentioned, quite a lengthy process and, and uh, an uh, application registration process. I'd, I'd like at this stage actually to launch a third and, and final poll today um, to see, um, <clears throat> to look a little bit more at the approximate share of uh, Wolfie and Joint Ventures on total direct investment to China. So I will launch this poll. Um, and um, if you could take a, a few moments to, to answer that, and maybe Lamilla, you can uh, you can explain a little bit uh, behind the, uh, the the poll here and the question. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. So um, I can see you are you are still uh, voting, and the question was, what is the approximate share of Wolfie and uh, joint ventures? Uh, on the total foreign direct investment to China means uh, when you take the sum of the foreign direct investment to China what part is contributed by Wufi and what part is contributed by joint ventures. Okay, thank you. So I leave you just a couple a couple more seconds to, to answer. Um, we still have a few uh, votes coming in. Right, and uh, I will share these uh, results with you now. So 45% uh, percent of you have opted for 55% um, from Morphe and 37% from the joint venture, followed closely by 39%. Mm. Yeah, and um, which is the 35% Morphe and 40% joint venture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, those who, who voted, who selected the third option, means 80% for the Wufi and 18% for the joint venture were right. Yeah, so it's, uh, might, for someone might be surprising, but the Wufi is the most often uh, vehicle to invest uh, to China, and the reasons are, are ob obvious, because uh, foreign investors, they still uh, and more would like to uh, have a management of the company management of the business under under control, but we don't know how it will be in, in the future. It might the the uh, ratio might might change in the favor of the joint ventures. Okay, thank you, Lubmila. So, getting back now to to the next point in your in your presentation. <clears throat> yeah. Now, a little bit uh, boring part the paperwork. But it's it's necessary. It's necessary in any country, and um, it's necessary in China as well. When you will be uh, preparing uh, documents and the applications for establishment of, of the Wufi, uh, you will be asked to submit uh, a lot of uh, documents. Here we mention only the most important ones. <coughs> uh, I will uh, I will not read uh, one by one. I mean, if I just click, uh, and you can see uh, what are the most uh, important documents. Certificate of incorporation. I have seen uh, one of the questions uh, asking uh, asking us what is the certificate of incorporation. It's basically the the document like a business license which certifies that your company in, um, in Europe was uh, legally established. <clears throat> Great divorceness letter is um, a document issued by your bank where you have a where your company uh, has account and it certifies that you have sufficient uh, amount of, uh, of money uh, in your account to uh, contribute uh, to, the, to the registered capital. Uh, passport, it does not need uh, specific uh, explanations. Audited financial statements uh, and report, usually between one to three past years, but it's not uh, asked uh, in all cases. And then it comes for the documents for the for the Wufi, for the company itself. Feasibility study, it's, it is very, very important document. 
It is basically business and financial and operational plan. Based on this, uh, the, the Bureau of Commerce, which approves the foreign investment, will judge where you own your, uh, when you will be approved or not. Uh, articles of association, uh, self-explanatory, shareholders agreement in case that there are two or more investors. There is always mistake which uh, thinks that the uh, Wufi is a company which has only one foreign investor. One foreign investor it does not need to be the case. You can have more investors, but all of them have to be a foreign foreigners. Then uh, you have to submit um, original uh, or certified copy uh, of your lease contract for premises. Uh, here, here in China, uh, in order to show that the premises you will use are uh, suitable for the commercial or for the uh, for the business you are going to conduct. Again, passport and appointment letter for the legal representative, and uh, same uh, together with the CV for the general general manager. Uh, here, just tax certificate to have something different than only the text, so you can see a few pictures. And then we come to the registered capital. Uh, minimum registered capital according to the law is 30,000 RMB. So it's 30,000 RMB when there are uh, two or more shareholders. And 100,000 RMB if there is one shareholder only. Um, so minimum 30,000 RMB, so that's um, just less than 4,000 euros. That seems um, pretty low for, mm. it, for the establishment of a, a Wolfie. Yeah, yeah you, you are right. And this minimum registered capital uh, does not refer, it's not applicable only to the foreign invested companies. This minimum registered capital is uh, applicable to the all uh, limited liability companies, including the Chinese ones. Uh, however, it's not so easy for the foreign companies because uh, because the level of your registered capital, the amount, will depends on a uh, few uh, of few points. So one is this, the location, industry, business scope, and the business plan. For example, uh, if uh, you will have a buffet the business scope for retailing, wholesaling, foreign trade, means import-export, usually the registered capital is between 500,000 RMB to 1 million. But as well, it depends on the location and uh, size of your business. Now, uh, in explanation of the two points, uh, two terms, which usually makes a confusion. First one is registered capital. This capital is simply the amount which is contributed by foreign uh, investors, uh, by foreign investors, and its purpose is to finance the operation of the company, and it's also the amount of the investor's liability. Total investment is the sum of the registered capital as above, and loan, uh, foreign exchange offshore loan usually provided uh, by the investor itself. Example to explain these two points. If you set up a total investment in 1 million US dollars, then registered capital uh, will be 700,000 RMB. And in addition to that, you can have a, a foreign exchange loan in amount of three, uh, 300,000 RMB. It's very important to plan the uh, the capital in registered capital and total investment because the prolongation and increase takes quite a, quite time. Here you can see the table, which is uh, which put together a ratio between total investment and registered capital. You can see the the higher total investment the lower registered capital you can have and the higher uh, foreign loan you can have. 
this is very quickly a list of all authorities uh, you will need during the establishment process, which is Ministry of Commerce, uh, Com Ministry of Commerce, which is responsible for giving you approval for uh, foreign investment. Uh, administration of Industry and Commerce will be uh, responsible for registration, and then the other ones are self-explanatory. And of course, tax authorities. Uh, when we go, when we touch the WUFI uh, operation, uh, those will be the person you will need to hire: executive director or the board of directors, legal representative, general manager. About taxes, there is corporate in ta income tax, which is generally in the level of 25 percent. You can have it 20 for small taxpayers. And of course, the same what I what I mentioned, the rep office, it's annual check. And this is the last uh, slide uh, for this webinar, which you can see the comparison of representative office and uh, WUFI advantages, disadvantages, IPR, human resources uh, in terms of the investment risk and administration issues. So uh, if I make it shortly, the advantages of the rep office is you don't need to contribute capital requirement. It's easy uh, and fast to establish. Uh, however, the disadvantage is you cannot provide any services and you cannot do any business. In terms of the well, WUFI uh, advantages, you have all you have all business under the control. However, you uh, you run quite high investment risk because you have to contribute uh, depending on your business quite a substantial amount. Thank you very much, Lib Miller, for this summary. Um, it, in terms of the, the process, because I, I, I know that um, several um, listeners today have asked the same question, how long mm. does it take to set up a rep office compared to a WUFI? Um, what is the, the standard time? And you mentioned uh, earlier the current um, annual check that's underway from March to July. Could companies ex expect even further delays on applications or changes within their applications mm -hmm. during that time? Yeah. Well, it's a, that's a good question. In terms of the representative office, uh, establishment should take around two months. Uh, in terms of the WUFI, it very much depends on the business scope and how many approvals or additional approvals you would need. Uh, usually it takes between three to six months, but it can take uh, up to the nine or ten months easily. And what would be the costs involved? Uh, the costs, uh, I mean, administrative costs are not, not substantial, uh, so it's not the, the biggest, uh, biggest expense related to, uh, to the establishment. The largest expense in terms of the WUFI is, of course, the, the, the registered capital. And uh, I forgot one point you mentioned, uh, you mentioned... The annual check. Yes, yes. Uh, the annual check. Uh, between March and uh, July every year there is a procedure which is called annual review or annual check where all the uh, documents, licenses and uh, financial statements are revised by, uh, by appropriate authorities. And if you decide to establish a company during this, uh, this time or you, you decide to make any changes during this time, it might take, uh, it might take longer. Okay, thank you, Lib Miller. Um, we are now looking um, to move on to some more questions and answers. Um, we've had many, many questions come through, so I apologize, first of all, if we don't get around to your question, um, but bear with us uh, after the webinar. We'll get one of our experts to respond to you as well. Um, let me just go through um, a list that I'm getting through now. So I can see um, questions here relating to the establishment of a WUFI, Lib Miller. Can a foreign individual establish a WUFI? A WUFI? Yes, uh, foreign, foreign individual can establish a WUFI. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, a company here that has already established a representative office and now they would like to convert it into a WUFI. So what would be the procedure they would have to undergo there? Would they have to first of all close the rep office before applying to establish a WUFI? How yeah. does it work? I mean, these two procedures are independent one independent one, uh, which means you cannot, uh, you cannot convert rep office to the WUFI. 
So either you close Rufi and uh, you either you close RepOffice and you will establish Rufi, or you can keep your RepOffice running and uh, parallel to that establish a Rufi. Okay, I see some questions here as well um, regarding joint ventures. Um, possibly I might leave these till um, till another time um, because we are running short for time today. We will be having a webinar soon on joint ventures, um, so there we will we will cover that topic uh, separately. Um, the question is relating to the differences of, of the two types of joint ventures you mentioned. I would also um, remind everybody listening that we do have online guides for the setup of a rep office in China as well as a very comprehensive guide on the establishment of an FIE, a foreign invested enterprise and you can download these for free upon registration from our knowledge center online. I also would encourage you to look at the second report of the diagnostic kit available from the knowledge center as well because that looks at all different vehicles uh, available to enter the Chinese market. Um, so just going through a couple more questions, I think we have um, a, a little bit of time remaining. Um, here again, um, again on Woofies actually, um, when a, okay so the question is when I register uh, a Woofie in Beijing um, but later would like to do business in Shanghai because my clients are based in Shanghai or most of my clients are based there, do I need to establish a new Woofie in Shanghai? Um. It depends what you have written on your business license, which region uh, the business license uh, covers. So uh, it might be the case you will you will need to establish a new company in Shanghai, but uh, it might be the case that you will be allowed to establish a branch there. So you will keep your move in Beijing and establish the branch in Shanghai or other other place where you wish to. Uh, make a business. Okay, and um, a company here that has established a Woofie but with a high amount of registered capital, um, they would like for part of that capital to be used as investment later into a subsidiary of the Woofie, um, but uh, they are getting advice from their legal advisor um, that they cannot do this. Is their legal advisor right? Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid that unfortunately the legal advisor is right and it's often mistake of the, um, uh, of the foreign uh, investors because they think that they will establish they will establish a company here, make a higher in, uh, investment, make a higher registered capital and then later on establish other subsidiary. So basically, uh, basically it's not uh, it's not allowed. Yeah, registered capital or the total investment it serves only it serves only for the operation financing the operational uh, needs of the of the company like uh, salaries or the purchasing equipment and so on. Okay, thank you, Ludmilla. Um, I think we have time just for one more question. Um, you mentioned here, um, it's mentioned that uh, a WUFI is not allowed in all industries. <coughs> uh, you mentioned the catalog of industries that are permitted, restricted, disallowed. Um, the question is, how can I find out, um, so the company is asking, how can I find out uh, if I can indeed establish a WUFI? Yeah. So, um, one... Um, one of the options is, of course, to go through the whole catalog, uh, through the whole catalog of the foreign direct uh, foreign investment. But more practical is to put together a list of the activities which your company would like to would like to do, where you would like to operate. And then, when you will finish, then uh, when you will choose the location, visit the local uh, bureau of commerce and uh, discuss with them what type of uh, either movie or the joint venture you can, you can have. Well, Lamilla, thank you very, very much for answering all those questions for your very in-depth in um, presentation of the two forms of uh, vehicles, Rep Office and Woofie. Um, I think some very valuable insight there. Um, again, I encourage listeners that if we haven't managed to answer your question today, bear with us and we will get back to them. We've noted your questions down. Um, you may also, if you think of more 
uh, inquiries in the future, you may also contact us directly through the uh, email address here on the screen or via our home page as the expert channel. I just want to bring to your attention um, next week's webinar that we will um, we will be organizing on how to write, find the right partner, the right partner in China, so looking at due diligence. Um, please note the new timing for those um, joining us from China. Um, it will still be at 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. Central European time, but that will now be 4 till 5 p.m. Beijing time uh, due to the clocks changing in Europe. Um, I also encourage you to visit our events uh, calendar online to see what other events we've got coming up here in China, but also across Europe. And of course, if you've missed anything from today's webinar, you'd like to revisit, then we will be posting the recording of today's webinar on, online in our Knowledge Center, but also on our YouTube channel. And um, just before you go, I remind you all that there'll be a short survey just as you log out from the, from the webinar today. So I, please take your time. We value your feedback. So that leaves me to thank you all for listening. Thanks to everybody in Europe. Thanks to everybody listening from China. And we look forward to seeing you in our next webinar series. And thank you very much, Ludmilla, for today's presentation. Thank you. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>